you can you can get similar to like 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 like
Are you, you're taking a list and you're getting those three elements. Yeah, the, the, the three rows, because uh, we had three versions of each file size. Um, I'll take the mean of those, and then here I f am plotting uh, uh, just a, I don't know what it's called, like a, just a bar plot. But the problem that I ran into here is because the, the smallest file size, 0.1 megabytes, the largest I think was 500. So if you're trying to plot it, you know, like I had to make the figure humongous in order for you to actually see that there was something here. Uh, every normal time I would try to plot it, which I can try to do here, you just can't. Um, the figure size, that's, that's the uh, size in inches. You have to rerun the whole notebook. Oh, OK. Let's try to do this. I don't know how long it'll take because you're. Oh, oh, that's true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so. Um, I had to change the figure size, and uh, I chose uh, 40 by 100, and that was just trial and error because you know everything else just you couldn't see the first two um, bars there. I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Cool. So the suggestion I have on this plot because a few people ran into this issue of like the dynamic range, right? 0.1 megabytes up to 500 megabytes, and the file times, those are also a large range. Whenever you get into a situation like that, for any axis, right? So in this case, it was the x-axis at a, a high range. I would suggest using a, a log axis. So you can basically rescale that to show more of the changes visually on a log scale. So that can be done to either the x-axis in isolation the y-axis in Ison or both axes, and it's called log log plot. Um, and so you can apply it. So after you plot the the data, you can just call like plt dot semi log x, and it will rescale that axis, and then it'll be like powers of ten rather than normal numbering. So that's just a. <laughs> this is like something I have to play around with this figure. Like, does the data plot visually nicely normally? And if no, is it because of the high dynamic range? Just like throw the three different permutations of semi log x and log y log log. Does do any of those help? And if the answer is yes, use it. I don't have any like fancy calculus I go through to figure out what is the scale to use. I just try the three, and then if that works, or if I need it, right, then I try the three. And if any of those three work, use it. So that's my lazy method of figuring it out. Other, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was another. So in the assignment, I suggested that people email me if they ran into a bottleneck of it was taking too long. And there were a lot of different ways to make the code run more quickly. Um, some people just didn't run that larger file and then, like, you know, got points docked for that. But the other methods were like generate a data frame of like a few thousand rows, which is pretty quick, and then make copies of that. You know, so like basically you'd say like rows one through a thousand filled with random values. Then repeat that for the next few however many thousands you you need. And there's a lot of different ways to create a data frame, right? You can create it from a list, like we saw here. You can create it from a dictionary. You can create it from just like calling random values in the elements. And depending on which one of those routes you create your data frame through, the way in which you would sort of do the copying is different. But. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. What wasn't wasn't running? Oh, SHU till. Yeah. Correct. Yes, yes. So what you're trying to do is copy it on disk, it sounded like. Is that right? So what I was just describing was the method of copying it in Python yep. be before creating the data frame. Yep. Yep. OK. 
Well, good news, bad news. There'll be another chance to do that uh, with this homework this week. So, <laughs> inspiring, right? <laughs> it's totally different. You'll figure it out. <laughs> you'll probably. I'm not sure whether you'll be disappointed in the homework or it's just gonna. It's different. All right, moving off into the lecture. All right, so I've intentionally have a lot of slides, and so whatever we don't get to in this lecture, which might be cost-benefit analysis, it'll spill over to the next lecture, and we'll also cover some ethics discussions. This proceeds. There we go. All right, so, we, so we're almost at last. Do you have any questions about projects? I exist. <laughs> All right, so because you're working with uh, data for your projects that um, I haven't given you, it'll probably be messy and unclean, and therefore you might observe this problem. So when you're reading this, and maybe you've already seen this, because I took this snapshot out of a data set that I was using for lecture four, so you've probably definitely seen that. Right? So this is a complaint basically saying like, here's a huge few of numbers, and then it says at the end here, have mixed types, specify the dtype option on import of that number. So if you see that issue, that's Python trying to be smart about how it reads in the data. And so it's trying to be efficient, but it's sort of choking on the fact that your data doesn't adhere to its expectations. So this is a pretty easily resolvable problem. You can read it here at this. But basically the issue is that for each of these columns, because these are the number of columns it's being in, it's getting confused about what the data is. So read that, that's in the links. All right, so my goal is, um, this is going to be a lot of like soft skills in this class. So if you don't like soft skills, be disappointed in this class. All right, but we do have a lot of activities to get through. So uh, I'm going to start with um, profiling. Has anyone here heard of profiling in the computer programming sense? One? Oh, okay. So profiling basically looks at, um, in, in, a, in a programming sense, looks at how well your code is performing. And what that really means is, as you step through each line of code, which one is taking time? Right? So in the end, when you run your program, it's going to take some number of minutes or seconds. But the amount of time spent per line is different. And that's because the cost of doing each operation of each line has a different sort of uh, bottleneck on your computer, whether it's memory or disk or CPU. All those take different amount of time. So as you're stepping through, it's not uniformly distributed among the code. So uh, people who write programming languages understand that. They try and write efficient code, usually, uh, when they're writing the language. Um, so you normally, in this class, we haven't encountered that. We haven't, like with the exception of this previous homework, had significant computational constraints, right? Like if you try and chase after a couple gigabyte CSV, yes, you'll probably have some problems. But for most of the problems that we work on at this scale, Python's perfectly fine. don't have to worry about it. So this gets to the question of like, well, if it is a big data set, or if my program is taking a long time to run, what do I do? Right? And it's, it's usually not a wise idea to just say, I have a 1,000 lines. I'm going to try to make each of those 1,000 lines faster. Usually, because of the non-uniform distribution of the time of execution, if you can figure out which lines are taking more time, then you can focus your efforts there and figure out, oh, how do I make that line faster, right? rather than all the lines of code? So when we're looking for faster, more efficient code using less memory, we want to focus on the hottest, um, most intense code first as a way of optimizing. Okay, so we've already seen this in some practice, right? Like where we can manually sort of use this uh, timer method to figure out how long some code executed, but you would not want to do that on every line of code. Right? That would be just a horrendous use of your time. So. We're going to get away from doing that, and we're going to use some uh, different methods that we'll, we'll show you. I think I've covered magics before, but these are specific to Jupyter. And then we'll talk about some other Python specific things. Um, 
I think it uh, clear sounds. All right, so basically, there's a really well written. So, if I haven't already gushed over Jake Vanderplas, he's amazing. You definitely get to know him on YouTube. Uh, so, he's got a really good article on this that covers it uh, in more depth than I'll cover here. So, if you get excited about these things, a good article to start with. Basically, Python provides a bunch of magic commands that allow you to do things to your Python from Jupyter. Right. So, I'm going to use. Uh, a couple different packages here. Yep, that, that should be marked down. All right, so that basically I'm going to have uh, some fake code, okay, code that is a Python. So this multiply function is pretty complicated. It takes an input, multiplies it by two, and adds one, and then returns nothing. Okay. That's code that I like. It's simple, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> also not useful. And then there's another function which is slightly more complicated. It's actually somewhat complicated intent. It calculates the prime numbers up to whatever you put in for an input. So it defaults to a thousand if you don't give an argument. But you're doing a bunch of math here, basically, and the sneaky part is I hooked in this other function just so we have a function from a function. Yeah. So that first function, if I call it, it just executes. If I call the second function, it executes, and I call it the function. It was a tendency. If it's still installing. All right. So, how's it going? Wait for this to finish up, and then it should execute these cells. So, I'm going to use a magic command called time, and it's going to take how long the function call takes. So, it's pretty straightforward. But it only does one line at a time. The other command, if you put in 2% time, that's time. That's the nice time of your thing in the cell. So before we were using this uh, you know, manually inserted set of lines to measure how long arbitrary sections of code took, this is just going to time the entire cell. <coughs> Not sure why this is still working on. There we go. All right. So we ran the primes code and it took 30, uh, 3.35 milliseconds and got some output. If you have a microphone turned on, you should come okay. All right, so the, the trick when you're doing output time, when you're measuring code, is you typically don't want to print things to screen. Because printing things to screen takes time for your computer. And it's typically not the code, it's not the timing you care about. So since I don't actually need this list of prime values, I'm just going to hide the output by assigning it to a variable that I don't care about. So there's a marginally faster runtime there, right? 63 versus 38 microseconds. And it, but it really matters, right, when you're doing larger things. So, like, this is what? A million? Yeah, so getting all the primes up to a million is a second. That's right, cool, whatever, times, it's good. All right, so the timing function is slightly different. Rather than uh, timing the execution of a line, it does multiple runs, right? So this is basically what you just did in your homework manually. So it only does one line at a time, and it does, uh, yeah, it's also seven runs, and it's still the average standard deviation. Pretty handy if you're doing one line, yeah. Uh, if you, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's important. so yes, you could set time it to do the three runs, that would be correct. And because you were only, you were basically timing TF on that TFB, that's one line, the next case is of course. The catch here is that the output of this uh, Jupyter specific thing is to the output. Set. And so there is a stack overflow code on capturing the output of this, right? Because this is this is something that a variable that you want to store like, to come back to later. And that's basically this thing here is about capturing that output. It's a little messy. But yes. That would have worked if we could capture the output. Okay. So Yeah, 
if we're doing the slide is like the manual approach. Yeah. So basically, this is a line profiler and a cell profiler. All right. So there's some fancier things. So suppose that we don't care about just the execution of the function, but we actually want to see how much time is being each line code. Right. That's that's actual code profiling. So happens to be a module, not too surprising, called C profile. And so what you do is you basically pass it the function and its call to the C profile. And then that's going to run through the execution and record every single line of timing for that function. So you'll see it's, it's running, it's taking longer right, than just running the function itself. That's because the instrumentation of your code um, all right, don't know what that problem was, but moving on. Make this a little bit smaller. Yeah. Okay, so. So the nice thing here is it's calling all these functions and telling you um, how much time it took. So, let's take the lines over here. So, multiply, that function was called. Uh, this comprehension was called in the code. And the, the function itself. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, it's basically, there's a quarter down here about each of the columns. So, number of calls. Because the multiply was in the code loop, it was called many times. Let me get timing for that. Well, so you, you could figure out how much extra burden that was by differencing how long the C profile call took versus how long the function took. Yeah. But these are actual timing of the execution lines and functions. All right, sorry, I got ahead of myself. C profile does the function call timing. There we go, line time. All right, so. To get the line timer, there's uh, another magic cell that we can run. Gives you all the arguments there. But basically, it's the same idea. You run the profiler, and it spits back the execution time per line. There we go. So now we've got the, the timings, uh, time, and number of hits, number of line numbers. So it's much more useful, in my opinion. Because usually, you care about uh, two things, right? So you, in the original, I have to restart this. So why was this two steps, right? First, we did the, the C profile to get the function timing. And then uh, we looked at a specific function with the line profile. So if we wanted to look at um, how long, remember this function here is calling another function. So if we wanted to time how long that takes, we could specify that that should be the argument inspected. That, that would be the function inspected. And so when we run primes, we're telling it look at the function timing per line for multiply. Yeah, question? OK. <laughs> Basically, there's a lot going on in here. But we're stepping through how long execution take, how long do the module, how long do the function calls take, how long do the lines per function take? I'd not, I haven't, I like experimenting, so let's see if that works out. I want to, you're saying I should be able to do primes and multiply. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So I, the way that I would, so, just to like freestyle off your, your example there, if I um, took the list of functions from here, right, out of this output, then I could loop over each of the functions with my line profiler. I'd just be a list of things to process. Okay. So I think, and then it's a little decoder there. So line timing, setting stuff. Not sure what's dying. Mm. Right. If that happens again in the next notebook, we're going to restart Docker. Right. Questions on line profile? Right. 
And for John, this this was the slide that we we're talking about with the timing. Yeah. All right. So let's say that you have now found using the profiling which functions are taking the most time, which lines you want fast. So that's what we just discovered. What do we do? I'm super lazy, right? Because that's like my motto. I'm lazy. So rather than trying to make the code faster, I use a library to make the function go faster. Right? And the name of the library is Numba. So this is super lazy, right? <laughs> I found which code I want faster. Tell the Python to run faster. It's a two-step process, right? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> All right. So quick demo on number. This is a bit so <laughs> where the where this example is coming from for context. Woo. All right, that's not it. We're going to restart Jupyter here and see if it's happier. All right. So while we're waiting for Jupyter to restart, the story is um I went to a medical research lab and sort of uh, ask them, you know, what's going on in your lab? And they're like, well, we're having trouble with this code, and it's really slow. I'm just like, have you used Numba? And they said, no, we've never heard of that. OK, well, let's go see if it works on your code. And then I walked away, and it was 10 times faster. Right? Super lazy. Took like mm, an hour. So the hour wasn't spent actually um, getting Numba to work. It was documenting what Numba was doing to their code to make it faster. Because right, they wanted to see like what the scaling was, <laughs> right? That should sound familiar. And so, I had to show them like when you use Numba, this is not just how fast it is, but how much faster it will be at the scale you care about. That was the hour-long part. So, that's my positive experience with Numba. So, and there's a bunch of sort of like magic tweaks you can make, some parameter choices you can make. And I think we'll get started here because this notebook takes a little while. Like, basically, uh, yeah, there's some NumPy options. And basically, all that's going on under the hood is that Numba is taking your NumPy code and compiling it to machine code. That's, that's where the speed up happens, right? Rather than every line being dynamically executed by the kernel, Numba says, you know, <laughs> Trust me, I'll, I'll make your code better. And just like takes all that, looks for the num NumPy calls, and replaces those with compiled code, and it's faster. That's where the magic happens. All right, so this is, it happens to be the, uh, the same medical sort of like uh, computational problem that I was working on, so I just like borrowed it. <laughs> um, so that this function actually doesn't matter that much. Like, don't care about this piece. This is just the part that we're optimizing as sort of like a black box. We're throwing number. Hope it works. If it doesn't, then we'll have to think harder. All right. So the important thing to observe here is like they got a bunch of uh, for loops, like nested loops. Those are always good um, for optimization purposes. And they've got some math going on here, some very simple like list operations, right? So that's good. But for people who are doing lazy stuff like that, and then you'll wow them with how much faster their code is when you apply number. Right. So first thing I did, obviously, was um, profile their code. Uh, are we waiting for something? No? OK. This will be a short lecture if uh, Jupyter is not working for me. Yes. Right. So I'm gonna look at the, the code works here, but basically we're gonna call that function and then we're gonna look at the, the, the line profiling. Um, I'm not sure why that's not happy. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know what? Let me go back to it. it. Says it's happy. By the way, I'm not beyond asking for like if people have input on what I should be doing. Free to restart. Free to offer some suggestions. 
That is a brilliant first question. I'm just sort of stuck as to like it, it executes the first four cells, and then apparently doesn't get to this one. So let me try this. Yeah, so well, that's the one that's hanging up my cells. So I'm gonna I'm gonna restart without it, but it's okay. Yeah, Jupiter. Yeah, so this is part of Jupiter, right? It's a magic command. So run a statement through. Yeah, I think it's going to do function timing, but it's not really descriptive. Yet, so. It's going to see how this guy's going. Still not happy. All right. All right. Hmm. All right. Well, we make them back. Oh, it's installing. That's weird. All right. So it seems to be installing stuff. I'm gonna have to come back to this apparently, but once this is finished running, basically I'm gonna show that the function that we defined up here. I'm gonna ask where is most of the time being spent, and it's being spent in that function. So when I do line profiling, which should have already worked. Um, so this call right here is just setting up an array of random values, and that feeds into uh, feeding in the array and the deviation array, and the so when I do that, then it allows to see the output of that. Right, same thing as the last number. Look, the timing for each line in the cell. So I ended up trying to do a few different things. Uh, the first was see if I could make it concurrent, run in parallel. That ended up not working. Uh, uh, sorry, making it concurrent didn't work. But uh, eventually, what I figured out was that there was a, uh, a single for loop that could be replaced with a, a lambda function. So I also tried that. That ended up not working. And then, uh, in the end, throwing, uh, where'd it go, number. So throwing number is, is basically this step right here. This is where I was going. It's adding in this decorator for a function. It basically tells Python how to handle that function call. So if you haven't seen decorators before, think of them as modifications to your functions that um, other programs act on. So with this number call, and the suggestion time compiler takes some arguments, and those arguments are passed in, those are the things you get, those are the parameters you get to apply with for number, but most of them are sort of like, uh, this is on my part of like, does this work, does that work better? And these are the details of how the compilation is happening for the numpy code. So you can try a couple different things there, but basically, that's the part where you pass off this same function to number, and then, everything in the function. So the decorator only applies to the function. All right, I'm still super confused as to why this is. Oh, is it running? Hmm. Some, I apologize for my own confusion on why this is not a super happy notebook, but it looks like it's running through the, there we go. It ran through the test, scaling test and Finish. Let me figure out where the notebook is jumping. 5,000, 10,000. Okay, so that'll take a little while. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill my my own cell here and try again. Mm. All right. So I was doing some scaling tests. That's why it was taking so long. Uh, but in the end, all I really did was just throw on number, do a scaling test, and then it ran faster. So that's that's what this would eventually show here at the end. So I'll come back to this notebook later um, while we're taking a break or something, and then we'll see what the output was. Sorry for the. Uh, no, it's specific to NumPy. So 
and sometimes yes, it is specific to Python, but it's more specific, right? It's specific to a library. But we, so, right, so the, the connection here, why do we care? We don't use NumPy. No, we use pandas, which uses NumPy, right? So all those pandas operations you've been doing, those are really written in NumPy under the hood, which is why the relevance of NumPy for this class. Back to that. Now we get to the part, uh, which is mm, probably where I spend most of my time trying to take code that, so right, you get the data, then you have to write some analytic, analyze the data, and figure out, you know, now I want it to run on a lot of data. What do I do? Right. So usually, you're using your computer, you're happy, right, with the computer that you have, and, and why would I need to use more than my computer? Well, if you want to use a whole bunch of computers at once, that's the case where we're going to get to. Where we're going to start is the fact that your computer has the ability to do multiple things at once. That's good news to you. So I'm going to use specific words. Um, this is the way I've grown up, basically. Concurrency versus parallelism. So concurrency means doing things at the same time independently. Parallelism means doing the same thing, doing operations at the same time and communicating about that process. It's a really fine nuance, but almost everything that we'll do is concurrent. Parallelism is very typical. As I mentioned, you already own computers that have the ability to do this. So why not get a 2x speed up or 4x speed up? That sounds like a big win if you're waiting like you know, 24 hours versus 12 hours. It's a nice convenient factor. All right, so this is where you use your computer to take action. So you're going to, if who here is Windows? And Mac? Mm -hmm. So two Macs. All right, so for the Macs, you're going to be with me, you're going to be using Activity Manager. If you haven't used that, I'm going to wander around and see where you're at. For the Windows users, there's a bunch of different methods. All right, in the end, what I think you'll probably see is something like this. And so I'm going to leave this screen up for the Windows user to come back to the Mac. You should see something that looks like a task manager that's what this thing is called. You may have Windows 10, which is a place to view, but it's still there. And there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ways to get to task manager. All right, for the Mac people, this is what you'll see. Um, and then once you've opened up Activity Monitor, you'll want to look at the window and CPU history, and you'll get that graph. Okay. Do it. If you don't already have it open, I'll have to read it. So the, the relevance here is if you don't know how your computer is being used by the program driven, you won't know, you know, is it a bottleneck with the CPU, is it a bottleneck with memory, is it a bottleneck you have to be able to observe these things as your code runs to figure out what to change. Right, the nice, easy thing here is this is a very visual explanation that I have four processing cores on my computer. What does that mean when I'm running Python? That you can do four things at once. That's a 4x speed up. Right? Four times as fast on a big data set, that's really useful. And you haven't even left your computer. That's very powerful. All right. <laughs> so this is now my experiment on you. So I'm going to have you concurrently on off. Um, and I think this, we're only going to go to nine this time. So if you know those instructions come to nine, we're going to do this concurrently. <laughs> Does everyone remember what the definition of concurrent is? <laughs> so my one is over here. My other one is over here. Ready? Go. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. I know you can. What do we have? We got, we're trying to do things concurrently, right? We're going to count off at the same time independently. We got put the ones one. Okay. You have to self designate it a little bit. Communicate, right? We went on that side. <laughs> and you guys are progressing slowly. <laughs> and who's over here, right? You guys are not. 
All right. So this is not working well. So this, thank you for participating. <laughs> So what's up? So now you gotta find your partner, right? Who is not in the same location as you are. <laughs> that implies movement. Anyone working at over, like actively using more than fifty percent of your memory of your computer? Yes. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, same question for storage, except eight percent. Is anyone using more than eighty percent of their storage capacity on their computer? Yes. One. CPU. Anyone using more than fifty percent of their processing capacity currently? Great. Okay. Last one, network, more than 5% of your network. Zero, all right. So what do we, what do we notice here? Yeah, so, so let's say one CPU totally underutilized, right? Which should be the case because you're not using your computer. So it should be mostly idle, great, right? And now everyone here has at least two cores, I think it's not four. So there's an opportunity here to use those cores for your program. Network. Nobody's retransferring data as far as I know, so like this would be pretty idle. That's difficult. Storage. Um, typically, disk is pretty cheap, so people typically aren't using all of their disks because they're pretty big. I guess, Travis, how big is your disk? So, so typically, disk is cheap and large, and therefore not fully used. It's only reasonable. 
the last thing here is like a, a very consistent observation. Memory is expensive. Programs use a lot of it. You're almost always at capacity. So like making programs more memory efficient is a hard thing to do, but very common as a requirement to get your program to run fast. So I have uh, 250 gigs and we've all Right. So that, that's that's a reasonable size disk and you're using a lot of it. So that's good. Okay, so so this is like the most expensive thing often after the processor, and this is the thing that most programs use. Yeah. Question. Yeah, this is your own question. Why do you have this always use a one type of Yes. Yeah. So, so every time you open a new tab, that's like a separate process using its own memory space. So the details of why that uses a lot of memory space per tab. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> a specific answer on that one. Okay. So back to your desk. And we're now on a break. So let's come back at 8.04. <laughs>
So it's like, the X, if you want to stick with your gun, kind of feel I'm shying away from it. But it's like weirdly important to do that. I don't know why. Do to write into like a specific. Yeah, it's not the normal way to do it. So I think the end of the data frame can happen. That allows you to specify a location in the data frame by row and count. Yeah. Pretty sure. But I don't, it's not usually that value row column. Right. So, like here we have a data frame of ABC456, and then it's saying like at uh, row four, column D. Oh. We have to specify the, the rows and columns have to already exist. So uh, this notebook will be available, at, uh, you know, obviously in, in Blackboard, and it will have been run. But just to walk through it quickly, this is again the function that we're trying to get through Numba, and then the the function profiling did end up working. And so trying to figure out where your um, where your functions are spending the most time. One of the tricks that I think you'll you'll see when you do this for your homework is that uh, when you're when you're calling random or faker, those two libraries are often very computationally expensive. So it has to go into that external library, it has to do a bunch of mathematical calculations, and then return back to you a simple value. Right? That's often the most expensive thing if you're doing a lot of random calls. And so a trick to get around that, if you if you see that random or faker is being called a lot, you can uh, try and <laughs> reduce the number of calls to those external libraries. However, you could sort of get around that. All right. So yeah. now that I've got all this stuff installed, now it works. So again, taking the function that we're trying to optimize, that we know that's the one we're aiming for, and we run it against the line profiler, now we see that um, broken down line by line, not too surprisingly, the comments don't get uh, run through the timer. So the comments just get ignored. They're all in a, in a doc string. And we're looking at the number of uh, calls and the time per hit, right? And the percentage of time. So the easiest thing to sort of look in here is like, on your percentage of time, these all add up to 100%. So if you have a big number here, like 42, that's taking up a lot of your time. All right. And this for loop here is taking up another 10% of your time. All right. So this if block, 42% of your time. So, so this is where. Um, your time is being spent. Not surprisingly, it's inside both of the loops. Right? Time inside the loops being executed a lot. Okay. So then I wanted to look at the scaling of the function. That's what you guys did on homework. And so we kind of fit it to a polynomial, and we saw that as you put in more data, it's going to take longer. So that was sort of the motive for why we're doing the optimization. All right. And then I looked at uh, replacing a little snippet of the code, but that didn't end up working out. So Ignore that part. That's the part that didn't work. So it is slightly fast. Let's see, my notes here are slightly faster, but not significant. So ignore that row. Um, and then comparing the two results. And so when I write adding one line for number up on top of the function, that's the decorator, and then reran the timing function. So here we can see it was taking about, I think, uh, a minute and a half 
if that's right. So for the size, so when I give it a thousand elements in an array to process, it took 1.4 seconds, and 2,000 elements in the array took like between six and eight seconds. Right. So getting up to a billion elements, it's not going to work out. Right? Just computationally. So that's why we look at this timing, and here we see a thousand element vector is now taking 0 0.004 seconds. Right? That's for lazily inserting one line of code with, from one library, that's a nice speed up, right? Not bad. So now, to get to one second, we're running into like the 50,000 element arrays, right? And so now we're sort of like happy because maybe five seconds is something we can live with at that scale. So again, it's not to say that it's always going to get you the magic win, but it's at least worth investigating. So here we were able to get up to that 100,000 elements in our vector at 22 seconds, and that was roughly in the range where they wanted to be. So they went from like something that would take literally days to now seconds to win. I'm a little sad that I wasn't able to show you that the first pass. All right. All right, so, so now basically I've set you up for the advertisement that you can do line profiling, you can make your serial code faster, and we've just seen that we have the computational resources to uh, run things in parallel, right, concurrently. Those are good things to keep in mind when you're looking for speed. How do we do that? But one issue is that by default, Python executes sequentially, right? One processor executing in order that makes it easy debugging, right? The problem when we start running things like concurrently or in parallel, the debugging gets way harder. So the trick that I would recommend is that you always write the serial code first and then refer back to that as your debugging version. If your serial code does not work or is not the one, not the way you want it, making it concurrent or parallel is going to make it worse, right? Like it's going to get harder debugging. So just a little trick: you always start with serial code. All right. So obviously, use your computer. All right, and then there's a couple of things that um, change both in the hardware execution and the way in which you think about the problem. So some of you have already used the apply function. Is there any use the apply function? A couple of people. So that when you're using pandas, typically you have a thing that you want to make a transformation to the row of a data frame. So one way to think about the problem is you have a large number of rows, and I'm going to change the row, and the second row, and the third row, and the fourth row, right? For however many rows I have. That is the sequential operation being done when you apply a, a, a function. So the obvious way to think about this is, well, we could do a bunch of rows from different processors at the same time, right, to get that speed up. So the nice thing is some of the functions that you've already been using are very easy to make concurrent. So because every row in the data frame is independent from all the other rows and order doesn't matter, then uh, concurrency is pretty easy. All right, so I'm going to show you the most popular uh, library to do this in practice, multiprocessing. But it's a little confusing because it relies on your understanding of your computer, which is why we spent a little bit of time looking at your computer. OK. So when you're executing your notebook, that is a single process. And a process on your computer has a process ID, the ID. Um, and the process ID is the numeric identifier your, your computer uses to track what the program is doing. So in this cell here, I'm going to start with, um, if this is the main code in this notebook, um, it has a process ID. And then I've imported the multiprocess library. Uh, and I'm going to figure out what is my process ID. So I can see that uh, it was launched with, let's see, let's see, I call my func, that's this one. And I say, I'm in a function. What is my function ID? So I look at clock info. It's a command to get um, this function running. And so then I'm going to look at my process ID from the operating system. So this is just asking the operating system what's the process ID. And so it's uh, because we're running this uh, in multiprocessing, it's spawning a new process um, when I do this. So the parent process, right, that one had a process ID of seven, or sorry, mm, here we go. 
Yep. Current process 205. And then it's going to call another process um, and get a new process ID. OK. So that's just a little sort of like background context of like what your computer is doing for management. The next part is where we call that function, which does sort of the automatic parallelism for us. So if we wanted to have an array and we wanted to apply a bunch of uh, a function to elements of that array, we can do that serially, sequentially, processing through each element. Or we can actually apply map, which is that method of doing everything at once to all the elements of the list. Um, and then we're going to tell it run that function against all the elements. Okay. And I'm going to say you have available to you five processors to go run with. I don't actually have five. Those are two independent things. On my computer, I have four processors, but I can still oversubscribe and say I'm not allowed on five processes at once. Sometimes that's a good decision. Sometimes it's not. It depends on how well balanced your processes are. If you have a bunch of processes that are all well evenly loaded, it doesn't get you any value to overload your pro your computer with more processes than you have processors. Sometimes you can get some benefit out of it, though, if you have processes running with different amounts of workload, and they can finish at different times and fit it in there. OK. So this is sort of like a simple example that you would never see in practice. Right? But now let's, let's do something that's more concrete, right? something where we have a data frame. It should look familiar. Data frames are normal. right? And we're going to run a, a process against that concurrently and serially and see how they compare. So this data frame happens to have 100 rows 100 rows and four columns in it. And I'm going to partition uh, that data frame into chunks. The chunks is a, it's not a bend word. It's a commonly used word in this uh, domain to, to sort of partition out your data frame into chunks. And then we're going to apply a function to each chunk. Right? So we're going to do what I was describing earlier, where we take a function, in this case, uh, I'm going to apply this unnamed function uh, of multiplying elements by two. I'm going to create a new work on new column K in that data frame. So it's a really simple computational problem. Create right? a new column, double the original input. So let's uh, time how long it takes, right? So it's going to go off and it's going to um, it's going to pass our function the original data frame. Um, the function that we want to apply, and then the number of cores to, to use that's meant to um, chunk up our data frame and do the operation concurrently. So magical, right? <laughs> so let's see, how does that compare to actually just doing it serially? And chunking should be faster, right? So when I ran it um, in multiple chunks, it took 302 milliseconds. And when I ran it serially, it only took 19 milliseconds. <laughs> I'm so confused, right? Parallelism, concurrency, parallelism, this should make things faster, right? What is going on here? Exactly, overhead, right? So what did we have to do? We had to take that data. We had to split it into multiple pieces. We had to shift each of those pieces to the processor that it was being, the work was being done on. Then we had to do the work. Then we had to bring all those results back and unify them. That, in this case, for the scale that we're at, that turns out to be a lot longer than just doing it one, two, three, four, five, right, working through it serially. So there's an overhead cost. All right. So that's the thing to watch out for: is that naively applying uh, concurrency or parallelism doesn't always get you the win, especially when you're working at a small data scale. So at a larger data scale, that overhead cost of like shipping the data off to different threads doing the computation and shipping back, it can be amortized across the, the amount of work that you're doing per thread. The other place where you sort of can get more win is if you have a lot of threads um, running all at the same time, so let's say like maybe like a thousand, at the overhead cost can be amortized across more threads. It's better um, often in that case as well. Okay, question, so <laughs> John Deppey. Uh, any questions on multiprocessing? It's, it's really tricky. There's a lot of nuance to go into it. It's not where you want to start. Right? You want to start with the easier things of like looking for, am I calling an external library a bunch of times? Could I replace this for loop with a list comprehension? Could I run number? Right? 
exhaust your toolkit before moving into concurrency. Okay. So there's a couple good reads on that if you want to dive into that little detail, but um, there's a lot of nuance there. All right, so what I just described was a package that allows you to use all the resources on your computer. Good. But what if your computer, even with a four or eight cores, is still not enough? What are we going to do? We're going to use somebody else's computer, right, which is even bigger, or a bunch of computers all at once, right? So that's sort of like the next task, is how do we get from using just one computer concurrently to a bunch of computers concurrently? So there happens to be, because <laughs> everything ex exists in a library-based computer, Dask. So Dask is a, yet another library to learn. It's sometimes even slower than multiprocessing your serials. So you're like, well, why would I waste my time on that? Well, it's because it can take advantage of multiple computers running at the same time. So let's say I have a program that um, would take really long, and I, I could split it over 100 different computers, which is a very normal task to do. Dask is a way to take your data frame in pandas, basically make a few little tweaks to it, and then run across a whole bunch of computers. Again, there's still that overhead cost of having to split up the task and run it on a bunch of different computers. But at a certain scale, it wins out as being reasonable. OK. This is probably going <laughs> to take a little while to install. But basically, the, the quick preview of where this is going to go is we're going to compare Dask, I believe, against uh, Num uh, against the uh, multiprocessing, and it will show that on my computer, Dask turns out to be way slower. Not a big surprise, right? Because my computer isn't a cluster; it's just one computer. And so all that overhead spent on getting uh, the, the 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 program distributed to the different instances in Dask turns out to be more expensive than just doing it serially. So I'm going to steal my own thunder here, but uh, once this installs. So again, <laughs> it's the exact same data frame that I was using earlier, right? I'm super lazy again, right? <laughs> so uh, here, the difference is when I'm using uh, Dask, Dask has its own construct of what a data frame should look like. But it's close in both conceptual sense and both uh, and close in the way in which you call Dask. So this shouldn't look like super crazy, right? So we've imported. Dask as Dask data frame. It has its own data frame and construct, but it's just Dask DD. So I'm going I'm to use DD as my shortcut. And so I'm going to convert my pandas data frame into a Dask data frame. And all that's doing is sort of preparing it for the fact that it's going to be split up across different computers. Um, so it's a slightly different data structure. And then, again, just to re emphasize, I'm going to have a super simple task. I'm going to take uh, a row and multiply the, column, the value in column A by 2 and return that. So again, it's just whatever thing you're going to apply to your data frame. And then this is showing you, this is going to take a little while to run. This is me applying the match partition function. So this can feel pretty similar to that previous thing we did with multiprocessing, except here we're doing the stack. So again, we're splitting up in the function, playing with a bunch of different compute processing, and we're going to reunite the results. I can that variable. Let's just result from previous All right, so that you'll notice there's a bunch more arguments here. So like I have to specify what type of scheduler I'm going to use. Scheduler, what do we need a scheduler for, right? We're just doing Python. The scheduler is the way in which we're distributing the DAS across the multiple compute nodes. On one computer, so I don't need some fancy scheduler. So I'm just going to run these uh, different chunks as the thread model. So there's different scheduling methods. And because I'm local, I'm not going to use anything fancy. If you're using uh, multiple computers, typically someone has already gone ahead for, for you and set up the scheduler um, for those multiple computers. And so you'd have to specify what scheduler is in use. Yeah, that's, a, that's a deep rabbit hole. We're not going to go down. but. If you're in the business of setting up your own cluster, then you're not really doing it. Okay, so this is a small business, right? That's what you're going to do. 
Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and other things like that. But basically, like, yes, you could literally buy, you know, 10 Dell computers, put them in the closet, and then, like, you know, configure each Dell computer and set up a scheduler and then make that scheduler available to that. And so that's basically the system, I would call that system administration, plus management, whatever hands I'm not doing that, but basically you're managing a resource from an IT perspective. And you're exposing that hopefully to your data scientists so that they can go use a uh, computer resource like this. <laughs> yes. What size file? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I love the question. So, so we just did a. Okay, uh, this is still running. I'm, I'm a little sad. It's a little slow because I'm having such a large loop. Okay, so. Getting back to your question of like how big of like what's the change over the threshold, right? Of like when we're we using our computer versus when we're using our cluster, right? This is the class and cost benefit analysis. So we did a homework on filling up the timing, right, for uh, reading and writing files. Basically, this notebook comes that actually does the exact same thing. So um, let's do a comparison between the serial algorithm, how long does it take to run? How long does it take to multi-process to do it on one computer? How long does it take to do it on one computer? And basically, you're just going to have the exact same experiment across different scales to figure out where is the performance change. And at some point, serial will always win on a very really small data set because of that overhead cost. At some point, multi-processing will dominate. That'll be different, right? And so that threshold is very sensitive to the scale of the data and the complexity of the algorithm. And this is where you're your skills that you just demonstrated in the homework of being able to measure those scaling, that's the answer. But it, it, like the, an, the answer depends on your problem and the details of that. All right, sadly, again, I wasn't planning ahead, and I'll have to come back to this, is doing all of those scaling tests right now. <laughs> so, I, yeah, so unfortunately, I, I'm pretty sure I had a static PNG that I had been heard previously, but don't know where to go. All of these plots are going to show that trade-off curve that we were just talking about. So we're going to let this run in the background. All right, so I'm just doing the exact same thing you guys did in homework, but for different libraries. Okay. That's right, yep. So the environment that I have so my personal practice is that but often the universities, they have a bunch of old computers and they sell them to cheap. And so many years ago, I did buy like 10 computers and set up a cluster. Um, so that is certainly a thing that I, like if you really want to get hands-on practice, the best thing to do is like buy 10 $50 computers, which I found out and then go through their work, that's like setting them up in a network, getting them all the boxes on all the networks. Right, and then you all the software that makes it available to the data That's a non-trivial amount of work. It gives you an appreciation of what is the system that you have to do with that thousand of questions, right? That's sort of like the mind. But it's fully all of you can do that here. You got it. Yeah. You, no, I should <laughs> But what, right? <laughs> Whatever you learn in the class, right? That you can, if you know what questions to ask, and you can break the task down into little sub steps, and you can Google those little sub steps. Right? And it is fully doable. Yes. <laughs> you know how to use Google, right? That's what I'm saying. If you can ask the right question and you can break it down in the appropriate subtask, yes. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not an easy skill, but all right, perfect. It's okay, right? Use up enough time. Did I make it a little bigger? Maybe? No. So, if I could, uh, did I do that? Oh, I'm a little sad. All right. So, to answer Hector's question, I would have to zoom in, right? So, maybe you can see this a little bit, but down way here at the small scale, there's some crossing over happening, right? So, like, you can see this blue curve, which is the serial, 
that happens to be performing really well, right? Uh, green, that's the app. For whatever reason, I need it for something else better, but it's impossible to remind you that the green is Basically, <laughs> we're at a small enough scale where serial will dominate, and so this isn't a great example because I don't have a huge data set and a bunch of time to run it on, but the idea is like you just make this plot for your problem at your data scale of relevance and figure out where the problem is. Questions on that? Very, so my estimation, when you go off in the real world, I think you'll probably have to do this, right? Because like if you're only operating on small data sets and asking simple questions, you're not really challenging yourself, right? So to grow as a data scientist, you're invariably going to have to ask harder questions of more data on systems that you didn't necessarily build, and this is a trade-off you'll have to evaluate in order to make that progress. All right. There, I knew I, I stole that from somewhere. All right. Yeah. Then the other. Okay. So I was alluding earlier to other schedules, and I didn't want to make a mistake, so I waited this slide. But um, so Slurm, Mesos, Kubernetes, Yarn, and Hadoop. Those should be buzzwords that you've heard, even if you've never used that software, hopefully. Or at least one of those, right? So <laughs> these are typically um, schedulers available in a cluster that someone else has set up for you, or is available as an Amazon slash Google slash Azure resource. And so you can go off right now and drop some, some fat cash on a Kubernetes cluster from Google Compute Engine. That's the thing you can do now, right? And then you just tell your DAS engine, go use that Kubernetes cluster. You don't even have to go through that work of buying a bunch of computers and putting in your living room. Great. Okay. All right. So this is like the need for speed because. All right. So, but as I was saying earlier, you should only do this after you've got all of your serial code in order, working as you want. All right. Do we have time for next? Yep. All right. Perfect. So <laughs> we did a little bit of like demos with code. Now we're going to do some soft skills. All right. So you are the scientist in a large organization. How many people here think that they're going to work in a small company? So I have to work in a large organization. So I'm going to inflict upon you my experience, and this is like. This is a game that is as close to my experience as I can pause for you in a classroom with 20 people. So bear with me. It's going to be super complicated. You're going to be really confused, and then you'll know what I feel like at work. All right. All right. So first question is, um, do you think your customer will provide you with well-defined requirements? Let's go to a poll. Everybody's smirking. Some people aren't. All right. Polling, yes, no. Start. All right, we'll get back to the question over here. Is will your customers be able to provide you well-defined requirements? So we should have a landslide victory in this poll, right? If anyone participates, it should be a landslide. Let's see what we've got. No, no. So, so no yeses. That's I would agree. So this is a well-rounded class of people who understand what they're going to face in the real world. Good. Happy for you. OK, so how do we solve that problem, right? Like, we can't beat the customers up until they give us the answer, right? Like, they literally don't know themselves what the answer is. And so, like, how do we solve that problem, right? Like, we recognize that there is a problem. That's what the poll just showed. My question to you is, how are you going to solve that problem? I'm not going to be an answer, right? They so have to ask the customer, what do you really want? And they're going to be like, oh, I want this, I want that. You know, and like, this would be nice. And like, I don't know. Like, it's they literally don't know the answer because they, if they did have the solution, they'd just tell you, and then you'd solve it, and it'd be easy, right? But they don't have that. So my trick that I uh, would suggest to you is if you have a customer and they are supplying a service or good to someone else, ask that other person what they are wanting, which they may not know, and then once they tell you what they want, then you can figure out what your customer, the person you're working with, actually needs. This sounds burdensome, right? Why do I have to go talk to all these people? It's to get your job done, right? My goal is for you to be successful. How do you be successful? You deliver what the customer wants. Well, my customer doesn't know what they want, so I have to figure out what my customer customers want, and then reverse engineer what my customer benefits from, and then go do that. That's the chain of logic. It's really convoluted, and it gets worse, right? 
How, what did you say? Could you be a little louder? I don't even need to do this activity. I mean, we're done, right? He just gave it away. All right. It's still painful, but we're going to do it, so. <laughs> if the slide works. All right. So as, <laughs> right, talk to the person who has the information and walk away, right? That's pretty straightforward. The actual reality is you have to go talk to their, um, the people who are the customer's customer. But then, as Ken pointed out, you're going to be sort of uh, interfacing with people who, who are preventing you from doing your job. They're called management. <laughs> Sorry, if you're in management, I'm, I apologize for that. But right. so the problem is, if you go talk to a technical expert, you're probably wasting that person's time in the eyes of their management. So in order to proceed, you have to talk to the management to convince them that their free full time on their team is worth giving to you who is just asking a question to the management. So that's like a negotiation where you have to communicate what it is that you need, why you need it, convince them of the merit of the task, and go talk to that person with the data. It's a mess, right? Well, do that. All right. Oh, by the way, this isn't just some like random story. This has happened to me. I've been accused of interfering with the business practices by talking to people and wasting their time. Can you imagine that? I, I was flabbergasted. Like the first time I was like emotionally devastated, right? I am causing harm to the mission or the, you know, the, the product. Like, really? That, that's emotionally hurtful to me. It happens. All right. All right. So we're going to hand out some rules here. All right, so you have a piece of paper in front of you. You'll probably need some paper to write something down on. If you do, have to have that there. So this is going to be confusing, right? Straight up, it's confusing. It's confusing in real life. How many of you Right. So you have one of three things. You're either the top technical subject matter expert, that's like option one. Option two is you're the manager for a team of people doing a thing. Third option is you're the observer. So we've got Vinay and Brad and Travis. So three observers, yeah? Okay, so you actually have an active job in this process. You're going to write down what you're observing because we'll need that. Other people are going to be busy. <laughs> All right, so now that you've got your role description, you read that, it's convoluted, but stick with it. Um, you're going to team up with your manager. So find your manager. That's like step one. This is, we haven't started the game yet. This is just sort of logistics. Have you guys found your managers? Huh? So fine. If you're a technical person, find your manager. If you're a manager, find your technical person. You're alone? What are you? Are you a manager? No. Hardware resources. 
settling so <laughs> all right if you're fine so now the hard part this is where the game begins right so the game is <laughs> all right you might not have a partner you're you're a man right? yeah you don't have a technical person uh, well, no, I'm, I'm the data scientist. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll be the manager. So now the next phase of the task. So you, on your, if you're talking to a person, it describes who your customer is. Right? So now you have to figure out who your customer's customer is. And the manager's job is to make sure that your technical person isn't interfered with. <laughs> You have a customer on your side. Right? <laughs> oh, then you're the end. Yeah. <laughs> so people are going to chase you around. So I'm just going to walk around the river. Exactly. <laughs> you're trying to get work done, right? You're trying to get work done. You just need to get work done. You don't want to be interfered with. Sure. <laughs> you're trying to do work. <laughs>
I think I'm going to jump to the, the answer first. So, so let's see um, who's, I think John was sort of like a data scientist. Mm -hmm. So what was your title? I'm a data scientist. So did anyone have the product purchasing person as a so that product product purchasing as an assessment? Okay. No zero organization? Okay. Maybe a slip up on my papers, but we'll come back to that. All right. So, any observations from the observers? Waiting. So, time spent waiting. That's like a really, we'll come back to that. I don't know. Non observers can also make comments, but I'm trying to get feedback here. What was the first part? So there's a lot of work in searching. Yes. This has happened, so I used to work in an organization that was focused on modeling. And the word modeling in my organization used by a bunch of different teams. So often I would get a question of like modeling in a sense that I wasn't responsible for, but because I had been asked multiple times, I knew the point of over filing. So that's what, from my perspective, the person you're not going to do your work for it. So it took a lot of time, yeah. So, so the third time, 
that's time not spent doing data science. Right? And, and this is often a really common problem. As a data scientist, I want to be productive. So I write code in an Jupyter notebook and I make visualization and help people uh, report. I did data science, right? The problem is that often you won't know what the right product is to produce for your customers and you have to go out and talk to people. You have to find a kind of balance between talking to people about what they want, finding who your customer's customer is, and also doing the code. If you get too far into either of those, it can be balanced. That's where I see more problems. And the way that I exploit that, um, I try to find a balance and I exploit the fact that often I'm waiting for a response from the right? This goes right back to the concurrency model. So I can do about 10 projects at once. I'm not actually doing 10 projects at once. I'm waiting for nine projects while I work on one of them. But the hard part is queuing up all of those tasks internally, tracking the activities, and making forward progress. So it looks like I'm crazy productive, right? But I'm only doing one thing. That makes sense? Okay. Okay, so <laughs> I was trying to start off with that dependency diagram. We got some observations. So the things that I would want to sum up with, um, hopefully you walk away with the fact that you do need to communicate with people who are not in your team. I think that's hopefully obvious by now. Um, and then this is a more personality comment about some people just want to do work and other people just want to talk. And neither of those are necessarily right or wrong, but you can do too much of either. So figuring out what a person wants to do, that's important. And then managers, they're all about defending not only their workers, but their resources and all that stuff. And hopefully from the observer's perspective, you could see the chaos. When you go into a large organization, it will be chaotic. Why? Because of this. This is the churn of communication, people talking past each other because they're coming from different backgrounds, not communicating because they don't understand the words that each other are using. Right? This is the churn that you will see in a large organization. And if you're a data scientist hoping to accomplish something cool, you're going to be super emotionally frustrated because you're seeing the inability of you to do work and make progress and be successful. So that's just like something emotionally to prepare yourself for. This churn that was just happening, that's the norm. Right? It's not that, so you will never be in an organization that's like well run with no churn. Churn is the organization. That's the organization communicating with all of its participants. Okay, so. I think I'm missing a few slides. I'm not a developer, but a developer. Sorry? You were the software architect. Did you have a customer? And like, did you find your, your customer? Ah, I think so. So, this is sort of the key of the solution, right? This is based off of my um, sort of like experience with like the different chains of supply are dependent on each other and they're not sort of like nice and easy to understand. Usually this diagram isn't provided to you on the first day of your work. You laugh, like <laughs> wouldn't that make sense though, right? Like here's who to call when you have a problem. Here's how the organization is laid out hierarchically and here are all the dependencies on the different teams. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Nice. All right. I have to go back and revise this then. <laughs> All right. So it's not like I've been, uh, you know, building up this sort of this idea that you you should talk to other people and find that balance. Not to say that everybody does that, right? Some people are just like, you want to do the work that's relevant to you. That's fine. You will be able to write code, hopefully, right, and like make visualizations. But I'm advertising that you can improve the utility of your product by understanding the, re the requirements better. All right. And yes, your customer won't know what they want. So yeah, this is where I often people, people get stuck at this point right here. So they talk to their customer, right? That's the right thing to do. They realize their customer doesn't know what they want, and then like stop working. I always get confused on that, right? Like just because your customer doesn't know what they want doesn't mean you should stop. It means you should do something else. All right. And then uh, I think I was asked this uh, last semester, like, how do we predict requirements, right? Because it's one thing to say, this is what my customer wants now. It's another thing to say, I think in the future, my customer is going to want this. So getting the lead 
on what your customer is going to want before they know they want it is by talking to your customer's customer because that's where your customer's requirements will come from. Yeah, and then the other tactic that I was sort of thinking about is, well, if you knew that your organization was doing something and there's another company doing a similar organization offer, you could figure out what they're doing, but usually they're not as visible as that. Right? Companies sort of wall off their intellectual property so they can't see each other. And then if you know the holistic sort of customer chain, you can have a much better understanding of all the variables that go into a cost of ownership model. I don't know if we'll get to today. All right. Now I think we'll take a break. So break until 8.57.
Okay, so we got everybody back? Yeah. All right. So, some more. Okay, so the next section is on uh, sort of like a, a very subjective um, recommendation that I have. So, it's a little bit hard to quantify what the right choice is, but I'm going to hopefully give you some guiding principles about when to make a decision and how to make a decision. Okay, so I've been pounding. Python into your heads, and hopefully that little bit sticks, and then you understand like how to use it. But I haven't told you when you should use it, and I've just said like use it. And so um, often <laughs> we'll use the tool that we know first. Makes sense, right? It's where you should start. But the problem is not all problems are well suited to the tool that you know. And so invariably, at some point. If you're working on a sufficient variety of problems, efficient scale and complexity, you will run into a situation where the language you're used to isn't the right answer. Right. <laughs> um, I'm going to say that you're going to come into two different environments when you work as a data scientist. One is um, total freedom, super rare, right? or your environment is imposed upon you. Right? People tell you what choice to make, and then you're stuck with that. So if you're super lucky, you get to choose, but most of the time you won't. So you don't have to actually worry about this whole section if the choice is imposed upon you. But when you get the freedom, you should definitely use it. I don't know when that will happen. but So if you only know about Python, you literally can't make any choices because there's only one thing. So the first thing for you to sort of figure out is, what are all the different programming languages? Luckily, Wikipedia has the answer, right? So I'm not going to go over this because there's a long list of them. Hopefully, that shouldn't sort of like scare you, right? How many languages are there? Well, a lot, right? So every time a computer scientist graduates as an undergrad, they make a language. I think. That's the rule. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know if it gets in a Wikipedia page. But. So there's a lot of things here, right? So this is this is not cool. I'm not going to learn even all the names of the languages, much less how to use them or when to use them, right? I'll just stick with Python. I'm lazy, right? <laughs> but there's another way. So <laughs> yeah, no, there's some great lang language names that are just like sufficiently interesting that you're just like, huh, I wonder what that one's about, right? And they're all linked so you can look at it top uh, Wikipedia. So yeah. People intentionally name their languages because that's the primary advertisement. So the recommendation is the languages typically fall into categories. So rather than trying to exhaustively memorize the list of available languages, the easiest thing to figure out is what are the different types of languages and why are they different? And when would I use which type of language? That makes it um, a little bit easier. Again, I'm not going to go through this because there's already a table for it. I don't have to worry about it too much. Oh, I don't think that's the link I wanted people to. All right, let's look at this one. If I can go to that. All right, so there's a lovely table here, and I don't have to worry about um, figuring it out. But you know, when to use which language? These are the categories up on top. Imperative versus object oriented versus functional procedural. Those are the categories, and then all the languages on the side. So if you learn about each of the language categories, in some sense, you just look at the table and figure out what you want. Pretty straightforward. This one is wrong. All right, but the other, so there's some other guidance. So not all languages are free and open source. That's really typical in the. Um, domain space where I have a commercial company providing a solution, they will write their own language for that problem. So an example that I was inflicted upon was there's a engineering um, tool called Comsol. And Comsol, which you probably haven't heard of, has its own language. 
So this is a great way for a commercial company to lock you into their solution. If you've written a thousand programs, each of hundreds of lines in their language, how much effort do you want to put in moving to the different product, which is potentially better? You know, it's a barrier to exit, basically. Once you're using that language, which is typically a code you're free for that language, right? the problem is you're all stuck in that language for all the code you invested. And getting out of that investment is painful because it means you have to write everything in the next language you go to. So that's just something to keep in mind of. It looks easy to use. It does all the things I want, but think ahead to the exit because you're invariably going to want to change to something else. Um, the other advice here is there are a small subset of languages which are worth learning, right? Or at least exposing yourself to Java, Python, C, right? I don't know if somebody else wants to throw out some other ones, but you can just look at the top popular languages, top three, top five, at least know what they're doing. And then the last little tip is some languages are specific to a category of work. So example, this linear algebra, if you're doing anything in linear algebra, it's highly likely that you're using MATLAB. Why MATLAB? It's closed source, it's proprietary, that's, those are all bad things, right? But the problem is um, every sort of student using uh, linear algebra in school learns how to use MATLAB to bring some computation. That's because MATLAB, the company, offers their software at a reduced rate for students. A great time to pick off a customer base right, is when they're cheap and they don't have much money and they're trying to learn something, so you give them your language over a reduced rate. Guess who does that? Oh, UMBC, right? We have this whole portfolio of free software for educational discount, right? Why are they doing that? Because they want us to learn how to use their software, make that investment in developing the skills and using it, and right? have lower stats or whatever else. When you go off into your job, if you have freedom in making a choice for a language, you'll pick the one you know, which happens to be a proprietary language that costs a bunch of thousands of dollars for their software. Okay, so that's all a business practice discussion. It's not really data science, but it's something when you're a data scientist and you're trying to make your code reproducible, you should definitely think about it. Because right? if you want someone else to come into your team, you're going to inflict upon them the choice you've made about the language for their code. Um, so let's say that I am using a tool and I do want to change out because some other tool is better. Right? I don't have to. I can stick with the tool that's wrong. Lots of companies do that. Right? Because often, <laughs> I got a, Brad, do you have a story for that? Or? All right, so lots of companies will make um, a product written, written in software, right? and then they'll make some money off of it, and then that language will fall out of favor for whatever reason. Maybe something better came along, maybe something faster. Right? But that business has very little incentive to change languages because to change languages is a financial investment, which means less profit. And so there are still job positions open for COBOL programmers. So if you've programmed in COBOL and you're a good pro COBOL programmer, there are companies still running, what is that, like 30-year-old code, 40-year-old code, right? Why? Because all of their business logic is implemented in this old language, and the port out to something else would be very difficult. So, question? Yes. Why do you think that is? So Fortran, for those of you who haven't been around for 40 years, uh, I think it's like 50 or 60 years old. Right? So there's a computer language, 60 years old, in use now on the largest computers on Earth. Right? That's because the Department of Energy, which is composed of a bunch of scientists, yeah, went through their like PhD program and learned Fortran, uh, Fortran 77 is the one I used. <laughs> I used to work Fortran. So <laughs> there's, I think something someone estimated about four billion lines of Fortran running on computers now. Right? This gives you an idea of like how big of an investment, that big of an investment. So yes, you could write all the Fortran programs in Python or C or whatever you think is the right language. That means rewriting four billion lines of code, which probably has bugs in it, so you don't even want to reproduce those, right? Like, so, so there's a huge investment. And yes, these old languages are persistent because they have a large install base, still in active use.
if you want to. So <laughs> Fortran, by the way, first uh, written on punch cards. People in my department, when I was getting my degree, still had their programs on punch cards in their office because no one wants to throw away old code, even if it's on punch cards. <laughs> you're all sitting here with Jupyter notebooks and a laptop. You're just like, what is he talking about? <laughs> Okay, so if you still have a piece of paper, that's good. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is write down all the different costs. Right, this is a programming on this is a lecture on cost benefit analysis. So, what are the costs of switching away from whatever implementation you have? One more minute and ask for So let's say you have a not unreasonable estimate of a million lines of code in the product that you're currently producing. Right? The likelihood of you being able to melt one false to switch over to the new product is close to zero. Typically, there's a transition phase where, like, over the span of a couple of years, someone replaces this section of code with this. This would be right? in that process. You're not doing it in one quick step. Right, this is a long trial process of making sure everything works together in the case correctly and produces the same bug usually. Uh, okay, let's call it opportunity cost. So if I'm spending time rewriting the code that I have, that's time not making additional features or solving existing bugs. And so lost opportunity. I may have one more. Yes. Oh, you have to architect the new one, right? So, so you have an existing architecture and the implementation that currently exists. Why would I have to stick with that, right? We can make a new one. Do better. Yeah, so, so suppose, I right, suppose you were the business or product manager for a successful product and someone says, hey, we could read all, rewrite all of our Python because that's my favorite language. And you right, come back and say this, right? So you walk in an office and then you're going to change someone's mind. You're going to have to be able to address each of these. Right? You're going to have to say, this is how much training costs. This is how many people will have to hire, how many people have to fire, cost licenses, and cover. How many consultants you buy at what rate, right, for months. And then, hopefully, if you've added up all those costs, right, then you have to say, and when we pay all that money, we make this much more money next year because of that faster product with more people, more scalable. Cost benefit analysis basically costs 
and you have to be able to project, project out what is the cost savings or the benefits to your product that you're going to gain. Okay. So this is my sort of warning to you. If you do that transition too often, right? So let's say you do it every six months, you're probably not doing it right. And the problem is someone's going to come along to you and say every six months, you should be using this, you should be using Hadoop, you should be using Spark, you should be using Scala, you should be using Python, you should be using whatever the new hot thing is, right? And so the thing that I try to offer guidance on my management is where are we in that hype cycle on that subject? Is it because you read the Business Week article and most of you have these things to do? Or did you actually do your research and that has been around for 10 years and you know it's super stable and all the bugs are messed up so we can use it? The much less attractive like, option, but it's the right one. So, who here has not seen the hype cycle before? <laughs> okay, so basically, the, the idea is like there's going to be um, a new idea that will come along, like entirely, that will pass in every six months or so. Depending on the field you're in, someone will say, Holy crap, that's amazing, I solved all the problems. And then, and then after a while, they realize, Wait a minute, I didn't solve the problems that we're actually facing. Right? And then once you have had a product around for long enough, and people actually understand, oh, oh, that's what it's for. Right? So there's this mismatch of expectations, capabilities, and what you need, and getting them all together to match up. That takes a long time, typically years. And so if you're doing the new thing that's exciting, right, it's probably not a great investment unless you want to redo it every six months. Okay. So. Um, and this is a really conscious choice, right, that people get to make. Often startup companies who have no sort of like legacy thing to work with, they don't have to worry about that. They'll just do whatever's cool, right? And they're only going to exist for six months anyways because that's when their funding runs up. So it doesn't matter, right? So that's not data. No one's going to care anyway, right? So that's why they live over here. They get the most visibility on the thing they're doing because there's like a startup with a bunch of, you know, venture back things, blah, blah, blah. That's probably not where you want to be unless you're doing that. So if you're changing your company of product over to the thing that's exciting, you might be doing wrong. So I think there are people who think they want to live here, but often they're taking more risk than they're probably living over here. And then this is where I like to live. I'm just like, hey, I showed up and it works and there are no bugs. Yeah, that's where I want to be. Right? And then there's the people who are like, ah, I guess we can switch from Cobalt to Fortran. <laughs> okay. okay, but th this is a very explicit choice that you should sort of acknowledge and make about your decision making process. Like, where do you want to be? Do you want to be in the bleeding edge, the cutting edge, or like the dull edge? Right? Okay, so that's all I have to say on hardware. Uh, sorry, software. Questions on that? I don't know. It didn't. It did not answer the questions for you, but it brought up some points to think about potentially. Okay. Hardware. My favorite hardware, pencil and paper. <laughs> like, John was complaining about it being in the class. Like, I'm a pencil and paper person. Like, that's where I start. If it doesn't need to be anything else, it will be that. And and why is that? Because I'm super simple, and like I can shuffle the paper. And, like I don't lose my file system, right? And like there's no dependencies on software. It's pretty easy to manage at a small scale. But if I get above like five lines of writing something down, I'll switch over to something electronic, like Excel spreadsheet or you know something else. And so like how do you computer? Small tablet device, right? And like, so this the transition of scale and complexity sort of drives the hardware that you're looking at. Okay. So um, the other comment here harkens back to the earlier section of the class. If you can get away with using the current hardware, you absolutely should. It's the cheapest thing you have, right? The thing that you don't have to pay any money for. Use that. And you can use that if you're optimizing the code that you already wrote. You have to write new stuff. Mm, what else? Yeah, avoid hype. Right, we touched on that. And then um, scale when appropriate. So this is going back to your homework. If you're never going to operate on a gigabyte worth of CSV, then don't bother trying to scale out to a solution that would do that. Right? Why use DASC or multiprocessing if you can solve it in a few seconds on your computer running serially? Again, back to the GPUs. So someone mentioned, I think, G, like GPUs. That has been in the hype cycle for like two or three years, I don't know, maybe five, right? Like, everybody thinks, I need to do TensorFlow, I need to have GPUs, it needs to be accelerated. 
Probably not. Right? Like the number of people doing deep learning, you know, uh, code that they wrote on a GPU that's optimized well, very very small. Right? Number of people using GPUs with the inappropriate software framework on a problem they don't understand, huge. Probably ninety five percent. Right? <laughs> you laugh. That's where the money's being made, right? People who don't know any better, right? If I can make money as a hardware company or software company on people who don't know what they're doing, that's easy money, right? I just have to say it's the hotness. <laughs> that's what I would do if I were make money, right? Like convince people who are, don't know any better. Huh, what turns me to this slide? All right, so don't use a GPU if you don't have to, right? And so um, <laughs> you'll probably hopefully be forced into doing that in 602. Maybe my right. little GPU exposure is good for you. Yes, question. Okay, so thank you. On your computer, you have a central processing unit that I've been referring to as the CPU. Every computer has that. It's the thing that hosts the environment you're working with, the operating system, all the programs. It's the central processing unit. Okay, so your CPU sits here in the middle, and you've got your RAM. That was the thing that I was referring to earlier as memory and and disk and the network. So this is like your computer. You also happen to have a monitor on which you can see things going on. And that comes from having um, so a lot of the instructions being processed by your computer being done on the CPU. But some of the things like, let's say I want to have this pixel associated with the mouse movement. Now appear over here on this pixel. Oh, in this pixel, and not this pixel. Or I redraw a new window. That is also a bunch of computational math. Not appropriate for a CPU, but it's typically a GPU, a graphics processing. It's also about a central processing. So the instructions about the mouse is being moved, right, coming into your keyboard and mouse, that is a process instruction. That is a uh, instruction processed by your CPU. But then as far as actually drawing it on your screen, that's done by the graphics processing unit. Well, where those pixels are going to change on the screen, that is a lot of math that's on the CPU. So, so the problem is these are completely different architectures because they're solving completely different problems. So there's a bunch of um, dense, kind of like dense linear algebra being solved for this um, question of where my pixel is being shown up. That's a different problem typically than the type of instructions being run by your central processing unit. So because there's a difference in hardware, there's a difference in which programs are appropriate to run on the hardware. So the, it used to uh, be that everyone knew that graphics processing unit was hard. You would leave that to the people like NVIDIA, um, AMD, right? People, uh, API processing. Kind of so, so their idea was like, this is a specialized problem. We'll just leave it to specialized hardware. That's the same idea that you have for the network, right? No one would confuse that you should be doing some computations on your network card, right? So that's like a very straightforward thing, thing to think, that I have a specialized problem, I get the specialized hardware, the specialized hardware does it. Then, uh, and I remember, so I was in a summer school uh, probably about 15 years ago, where some crazy guy, right, this is like crazy fun, um, he took a Fortran program and rewrote it as a graphics processing problem. Right, because Fortran is really good at matrix math. That's what Fortran is developed for. Um, um, and then he realized that GPUs also do linear algebra for graphics. So I could rewrite my Fortran program as a graphics program. That'd be really fast because GPUs are such like hardware. Brilliant, right? It's a huge, like crazy investment. Years of his life spent rewriting a Fortran program into graphics. Then a few years later, NVIDIA said, oh, wait a minute, our graphics processing are really good at linear algebra. We could solve linear algebra problems on them. And they invented CUDA. Right? So this guy's like life work. It was like devastated by this company coming by and be like, oh yeah, we're going to make language for you. So then you have to be writing like OpenGL. So this graphics processing unit really good at linear algebra. They realized this. And then at the same time, someone realized that, and there's a specific person, um, rewrote a bunch of uh, neural network programs, also relying on linear algebra for GPUs. And so the guy that I was talking to, like, he was a scientific coding program, the part of the program. 
there's also this recognition, oh, you can do machine learning, deep learning, I mean, that means when you're on the ground, you use and it's really fast. So once you realize this and you rewrote um, his machine learning algorithm in three key languages, then his algorithm beat all the other um, code that had been submitted to the contest, this is like in 2004, that history of machine learning is yet. But uh, his code beat all the other machine learning models because he had so much more computational power because he was using GPU. So CUDA is invented by NVIDIA, and a guy demonstrates that you can really harness the GPU to do machine learning. And so this is right at the time where machine learning is like a renaissance. We're like, oh, we can do these little apps, and they're sort of agnostic, but they're wonderful. So there's a lot of magic of confluence of hardware vendors supplying a software language, recognition that machine learning is actually going to be used. If you have huge speed up, a lot of you just have a higher accuracy from more training. So a lot of these factors came together. And now we sit in the space where like TensorFlow and uh, you know Keras and all these other languages sort of rest on this concept that you can do your algebra on a GPU. Brings us back to this point so that people get in this hype train of I want to do more and faster and therefore it should be using a GPU. But they haven't actually connected the dots that the, uh, their problem would have to be heavily dependent on linear algebra. If you try to do something that's not linear algebra dependent on GPU, you will get no speed up and it'll actually explode. So the problem is you have to understand your problem deeply before making this train transition to hardware. Did I answer the question about a GPU? <laughs> All right. So. Choose the right hardware because it's the right thing to do, not because someone told you that it's a cool thing to do. All right, cloud hosting. And I think we may have to skip this, but. All right, so we've talked a little bit about um, changing the hardware. That means um, like maybe buying a different computer, but then going to the cloud, so. This is like my favorite thing to do about this exercise is that I gave you all the same assignment. And I gave you like basically three main vendors to look at. And the diversity of answers, right, is not surprising to me, but hopefully this to you. And I see the range here. So the lowest value, uh, $23 for a terabyte for a year, highest value, uh, 2803. That are main, right? Um 100, 100 terabytes per year, $45, someone claims. Someone else claims uh what was the high value? $73,000. So that, again, a bit of a range, right? <laughs> now, now you're thinking, why did this happen, right? <laughs> because hopefully if you didn't know, there were a lot of web pages describing a lot of different options. That's not an accident, right? If Google wanted to make, so think of like your Gmail, right? If you're using that, like how simple that is to use. That's not some accident, right? That's like, thousands of user interface developer hours being spent on them making sure that that interface is super crazy easy to use. Guess what they didn't do? And actually it's the opposite, right? For cloud pricing. It's complicated. It's spread out all over the place. There's a huge diversity of answers. You don't actually know exactly what you want and it doesn't map exactly into what they're offering. Huh, that's really hard. Guess how many people get that wrong? And then overpay, which is profit. By the way, that's profit, right? If you overpay, that's the company making profit off of your stupidity, right? So the fact that there's a diversity of right answers here, that's a great thing, right? Anyone paying more than they should is good. Except for if you're the user or the customer, right? Sorry, <laughs> well, that was you, oh my bad, we're not Google. All right, so, so this is an intentional design, right? Of like obfuscating the best price, right? They don't want a fair competition of what the market is gonna bear, they want to see how much they can charge, right? So it is naturally confusing to get pricing on this. How does this impact you, right? You're the data scientist. You just want to do work. I just want 100 terabytes per year. How hard is that? Well, this is how hard it is, right? If I send out 20 people to get one answer on one thing from three companies, I get 20 answers. And I bet you, if I ran the same problem next week, which I won't, <laughs> I would get different answers. Um, huh? <laughs> no, there's, so, so I, I think if you talk to like a, a sales specialist from each company, they could probably tune for you a better answer, but there's not a right answer. 
And I don't think even if you like took the average of these, I don't know that that'd be the right answer, right? <laughs> so the issue here is like um, they're intentionally trying to obfuscate their actual cost to you and the minimum. And so in the end, you're going to get charged for something, right? You're going to actually get a bill, no doubt, right, <laughs> if you use their services. The problem is you're probably using the wrong hardware or the wrong options, and you're overpaying for what you get. So that's that's by design. All right, can try some. It gets worse. I don't know what what is it. I don't even know what this is. Seventeen million from Amazon for a computer. Probably incorrect, but someone else from Google got uh, what is that? One point two million. So like, <laughs> you know, there's a range, but none of these are like that far from each other in some sense. All right. What's the lowest price? Mm. Twenty-three thousand. Looks about it. So sixteen thousand. Sorry. So like again, there's a big range. Okay, and then <laughs> there's this counter. So I found two different arguments from two different sources arguing opposite points about the same topic. So the question was, um, I ask you to get the cost of the compute for a year. That basically implies sort of a reserve price of I want this computer for a year. The other option is that you could dynamically sort of like scale this thing up and down as you need, right? If I'm going home for the night, I should turn off the computer. I don't need to be charged for that overnight use because I'm not using the computer. Right? So that sounds reasonable. So um, typically the, the elasticity, that's why we use the cloud, because I don't have to know what I need. I should just go off and buy what I need for the next hour or two that I'm going to use it, and then when I stop using it, turn it off. Right? That's all the elasticity. That's not what reservation is, right? Reservation is I need a thing, I need it dedicated, don't go away even when I'm not there. Right? And so this is like two balances of, of charges because those different price models um, make it even more confusing. So the on demand pricing versus spot pricing, spot availability, and we're encounter that. The spot availability, like I will pay this much for a computer if it becomes available, and if it doesn't, I will use it. Typically, the cheapest option that a cloud provider can give you. But from a user's perspective, it's really painful because, like, I don't know when this is going to show up. It's going to be now, 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 ever. And, like, and so it's unreliable in some sense, but really cheap. Or you can pay through the nose for, like, dedicated services, but then it's not really a cloud service, it's just like dedicated hosting for you. So, conflicting sort of objectives and the pricing each uh, for each is different. Questions on there? All right. <laughs> the last topic, which is my favorite. Um, so there's some bias here, right? A lot of these are zero or free. And that's, that's generally, like the pattern here is it's free to get your data into the cloud. That should sound familiar because we just talked about the idea of like writing your program in a specific language where you have to pay money for it. Getting out of that language is super painful. Just like getting data out of the cloud is super painful. So you typically have to pay to get your data out, and right, is what they don't want, and it's free to get it in. That's an incentive structure that benefits the cloud provider. All right, we're recognizing a pattern here. Right? People want to make money off of you who don't know any better. All right. I'm not preaching against them. It's a good thing for some cases, but just get you know, know what you're getting into. All right. Um, this was also sort of like a I didn't expect this result, so I'm sort of like surprised by it, but it's cool. Um, so I ask also to basically buy the same computer, but for yourself, right? And that doesn't expire after a year. It breaks occasionally, but it doesn't expire. Right? You still have the equipment after a year. So um, <laughs> these are wildly different um, sources of how to get the computer, like different configurations, but they're all falling roughly in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range, which I was pretty surprised by. I mean, like. The only three measurements, and they all came out relatively close to each other, I was pretty happy with that. All right. So, and again, not trying to, like, obviously the answer is going to depend on the scale you're interested in, um, you know, how much time you want a thing for. But you, it's pretty straightforward to do a cost comparison between three answers that are consistently forty to $50,000 versus, you know, like, you sum up basically getting your data into and out of the cloud, storing the data, and doing the compute. Right, and you can take away your own math there because I'm not going to do the math for you. But um, I think for that case, you can sort of like figure out where the right balance is. 
and the fact that you end up with the hardware after a year versus nothing after a year. Again, it depends on whether you're sending. If I want a thousand node Kubernetes cluster for five minutes, probably not buying my own hardware is the you know right decision. But again, it depends on the problem you're solving. I would argue for data science, typically you want to spin up um, something where you can do exploration on a lot of data in memory for a reasonable amount of time. Like I don't when I go home for the day and I come back, I still want my Python program to be there. I got, that's how lazy I am, right? I don't want to have to come in and spend the first hour getting the data into memory. And so having that reliability or the availability of the system is important for most of the time I'm doing exploration. That's what bit me on this lecture, actually, is like having to re-spin up all my code from all my notebooks. You'll notice that took like five to 10 minutes for each notebook. So all right. questions on the numbers before we get out of that? Yeah, Brett. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And and also. Yeah. And uh, so the other great thing, right? Let's say that I have um, a hard drive that fails in the cloud. As a customer, I don't even know that, mm -hmm. right? The data is backed up in triplicate or whatever, and it's never gone. And I don't have to worry about drive replacement. Downside to hardware acquisition. Yeah, you're responsible if the GPU is faulty, memory isn't seated correctly, hard drive fails, network goes down, right? All these factors that it's harder to quantify the cost, but it's typically something that people want to include when making the choice between these two. And again, if you're the data scientist and also the IT person, you're already doing that job, right? Like going back to if he's building his cluster and he knows how to do that, has that skill, the cost is effectively zero. Because you're just using it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. The compliance, right? Like, typically, lawyers want to be able to be told by the IT people that the data is being handled in a compliant manner, whether that means encrypted at rest, encrypted when transmitted, anonymized, right? All these sort of compliance features. Hiring a lawyer to validate that your IT is implemented correctly, Amazon did that for you. That's done, right? If a compliance profile, all this other good. Compliance issues typically handled by the people who manage the cloud, and you don't have to. It's another hidden cost. Okay. Any other cost? Like electricity, another good one, data hosting. Right? If I have to run a data center, those are usually expensive. <laughs> Just saying. All right. All right. So, a slight topic twist before we go off to the homework, and I'm going to skip over the cost benefit analysis, which is ironic. Um, but the sort of like other observation. Uh, to bash a little bit more on the cloud, folks. Um, they offer a lot of free software, right? They offer TensorFlow is free, um, right? Keras is being built into that now. They're trying to make their software more usable, right? They want you to use their software. It gets you to a concept called vendor lock-in. We've already um, discussed the um, the idea of educational, and then the last topic here is um, look at be on the lookout for courses that are. Mm, Provided by vendors. They're typically trying to educate you on their product. That's their goal. Okay, so this is the reason I, I'm not trying to name and shame here. I'm trying to help you recognize that there are tactics that companies use to try and make your life easier with the end goal of you buying the product. So it may sound free, but it's worth a cost. Okay, I will come back to these slides next week. There's a lot of slides. All right, getting to the end here. There we go. All right. So you have a piece of paper in front of you. Uh, it's a half sheet. It says learned on one side, questions on the other. Let's go that for a second.
Okay, so the slide that I have up basically is my favorite story from the past 10 years. It's like everything I've always learned about computers consolidated into a very quick business process, which is highly difficult. I think that's the best story. Right? So if, you're, if you haven't heard of Bitcoin, you should get out from under your rock. And Bitcoin is this idea of making money, right? again. And so they're using computers to do it. And so the question is, they're trying to find the best computer to run their code up. That's the underlying story. And best here is measured by making the most money. So it's a really straightforward cost-benefit analysis of if I invest this much money in a computer, how much money will I make when point? Really straightforward calculus, which drove the market to make changes and decisions really quickly. And unprecedented. The way that they made these migrations, the calculus was very fast, and people knew where the market was going, so they could anticipate it, but made it even faster. So there's a feedback loop there of Typically, business decisions are on the order of like years, maybe a decade, right? Like transitions are slow because businesses are large and the cost benefit proposition is clear. In this case, none of that applies, right? Really clear, really fast. You know where the market's going, you did it, right? So there's an essay. I recommend reading it. It's very readable. Um, I have a little bit of an essay. Okay. Does anybody have any opinions on Bitcoin they want to share in five minutes? <laughs> Has anyone used Bitcoin? Two, two, okay, cool. We have some users' experience. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Never attracted to this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the homework assignment here is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it. You. <laughs> <laughs> You've written code, code that was potentially, because you were early in the semester, not well written, right? Let's just face it, like code that you've, you've written, hopefully, like as a measure of this course, right? If you've learned something, the early assignments you've written could be rewritten and be a little bit better. How much better? Well, we could time it. You know, the first section of this section was, the first section of this lecture was timing your code runs. So let's see if we can go back, look at our old code, time it, see if we can find improvements Make the improvements, see what the difference is. Questions? So you, so you have a portfolio, hopefully. If you don't have a portfolio of your own work, um, let me know, but because I have it. <laughs> right. So you have a selection of netbooks to of netbooks, of no, notebooks to peruse and an instrument and figure out where is the easy win, right? I haven't told you which homework. So I don't care what the answer is, right? In some sense, I want to see that you can look at your own code and find improvements. That's the real goal. How much improvement? I don't care. Is it faster? Yeah, it's faster. So, so I don't care how you do it. Um, and you, like, you know, in this class, my goal has not ever been to make performance code really fast and tight. That's never been my goal. The only reason I'm doing this is to show you that you can do it. Right? I've given you some methods. Right? I don't care which one you use. You could not use any of them. If you find something else that's cool, again, I don't care. Is it 10%? Is it 2x? Is it 10x? If you can parallelize it, is it serial? I don't care. I call it the old notebook with the timing, the new notebook with the timing. There should be some difference or uh, improvements. To the uh, overall, the notebook should be faster. Good question. I think that's it. So, think all the opportunities you have. All right. Yeah. I will pause the recording. Yeah. Sorry. So, take your uh, your half sheets. Bring them up front. Your exercise slips. Need those back. And your name. Seems like it.